Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Because there's, there's, there's the losses that you have no control over, and then there's the losses that you do have control over. There's the wins that sometimes, you know what, you have no control over. You know what, sometimes you're so blessed, you can't even explain why you're so blessed. It's like, it's like accidental blessing. And then there's that intentional blessing. You know, there's that intentional uh, a win in life because you had goals and you had vision. And you can give people uh, all the steps that you took in order to get to the place that you're in now. And, and that's awesome. So there's accidental growth and then there's intentional growth as well. I want to live intentional growth. How about you? And so there's a man in the Bible, actually two guys, that just, they chose to lose. And let's be negative for a little bit. Can we go negative? Let's go negative. Let me tell you how you can lose intentionally. Are you ready? Look at Numbers chapter 20, verse 10 through 12. It says this. And Moses and Aaron. every say team. <laughs> so there's a team here. Moses. Team Moses. And Moses and Aaron, they gathered the assembly. You know the story. Just to kind of get the whole picture. You know that, you know what, uh, God called them. God chose them. God anointed him, God equipped him, and told him, go and set my people free. He goes to Egypt, brings the Israelites out. They're now going through the desert. They're whiners. They're complainers. Uh, nothing's good enough. God, There's nothing good that God can do uh, because it's just not enough. And so just think about the frustration of Moses and Aaron having to deal with drama every single day and let me tell you something I know that life sometimes can literally zap your strength I know that sometimes people can suck the life out of you I know that sometimes you can have people around you that will literally just make you feel like you're not going to win well that's what was happening with Moses and Aaron here just so you get a picture of this and so it says and so they gathered the people before the rock and he said to them here now, you rebels. It's not a good way to start a speech, is it? You rebels, you complainers, you whiners. He says, must we bring water for you out of this rock? I mean, this, this is how frustrated Moses is. Like, like, is this what you want me to do? Are you all thirsty now? Are you complaining of water? And he goes on to say, then Moses lifted up his hand and flipped them. No, he didn't. And Moses lifted up his hand and he struck. Look at this. He what? Struck. He what? Struck. He struck the rock twice with his rod. And water came out abundantly. And you know what? As I read this, I thank God that, that no matter how many mistakes you can make, that I can make, God can anoint your mistakes. God can take your mistakes and allow them to be your greatest teachers to get yourself together. And so, and the congregation and their animals drank, and the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. Uh-oh. Because you did not what? Believe me. <laughs> you would think, like, why give them water? They're thirsty. Because you did not believe me, <laughs> because you didn't play my, 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 my game play, To hallow me, to honor me, to respect me, to respect my authority, to respect my plan for your life, to respect my, my direction for the people. Because you did not hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. How many know right now, whether you like it or not, people are watching you right now. You are an open book everywhere you go. And if you say you're a Christian, guess what? You have just put yourself in a pedestal where people are watching you, looking at you. They're checking your attitude out. They're, they're checking your love walk. They're, they're checking your, your, your holy walk. They're, che they're checking just watching you, watching your family. They're watching how you're going to decide. They're, gonna, they're watching you how you're going to react or respond. And so God is saying, hey, listen, when I, when, when I spoke to you, and, and the reason that I'm having to deal with you now is because you did not believe me. And we'll talk about what they didn't believe. You did not believe me in the eyes of the people. In other words, God's saying, I want you to be an open book. 
right? Ready to be read by all so that when they see you, they see God. Amen? And then the Lord spoke to Moses, and because you did not believe me, you didn't hallow uh, me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Dang. These guys' decision to not want to get in God's plan. These guys, see, we know Moses was a, a, a God-fearing man. We know that. You can be God-fearing and still miss it. And, and God's like, because you did not obey what I asked you to do, it's game over. And we know the story. He took Moses home. And the children of Israel, they never made it to the promised land. And how, how, how much would that suck if God brings you out of a dark place in your life and you're st- you start going in your journey and you allow the, 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 the frustration the resentment, the anger, the bitterness, uh, the, the hurt to literally uh, steal your purpose, steal your vision, steal God's plan for your life. Because instead of, instead of listening to God's plan, that you end up striking the rock like a piñata. Right? It's just like, bam, bam. Just like, ah. Have you ever felt like that? So let me show you. So... It was game over. Now, here's the, here's, here's the truth. When you play a game, any sport, how many know that there are rules? And, and with those rules come boundaries. Now, the church, Christians, we don't like rules. When we hear the word rules, we think control. Remember that song, control? We think control. Why? Because I don't want to follow your rules. That's a problem. See, How many know that God has kingdom rules? And God's kingdom rules aren't meant to restrain you. They're meant to liberate you. Think about it. Whom the Son sets free is what? Free indeed. And so God sets up rules not to restrain you or keep you or hold you from from becoming everything he wants you to be. As a matter of fact, when we learn to honor and respect what God has given us as a game plan, God says it is liberating. It is free. Think about it. When you sin, do you ever feel good about it? Right? Like if you ever have that moment where, you know what, you're driving in the car and uh, you flip someone off, and then it just so happens that y'all both showed up at the same, you know, supermarket, and it's like, oh, dang, right? You start feeling bad about it, right? And so they're meant to liberate you when you can go ahead and just say, I'm going to suck it up. I want to flip this person off. I want to cuss them out. I want to tell them exactly how I feel. But you're just like, you know what? It's not worth it. It's liberating to you. Let's look at now what happened. Why did, they, why did God say to Moses and Aaron, game over? Here's why. In uh, Numbers 20, verse 7 through 8, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, this is backing it up before he hits the rock. He says, hey, take the rod. There's the instruction. There's the plan. There's the game. You and your brother Aaron gather the congregation together. And what does the next verse say? Speak to the rock. He didn't say hit the rock. He didn't say punch the rock. He said, speak to the rock. I think most of us would probably find less frustration in trying to always make something happen and start coming to the place where God said, speak to the mountain. Speak to that situation. What do we want to do? We want to go fix it. Speak to the rock before the eyes of the people, and it will yield. It will what? yield in other words when you speak god's saying i'm I'm, my plan is giving you an authority my plan when you speak is giving you an anointing that whenever you speak with the authority i gave you it has to obey you it will submit to you the rock will yield its water because you have spoken it from the authority that i have given you to speak to it and to see great miracles Amen? So when you speak to that mountain, you think it's you moving mountains? You ain't moving lick. You ain't ain't touching nothing. When you speak under the authority and the plan of God, that thing is obeying God, not you. It yields. It submits to God. And so he says, and it will yield its water. Thus, you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. 
And so we see that Moses didn't like God's plan. He was too frustrated. He was upset. He was angry about it and, and bitter and resentful because the people didn't believe in their leadership. And they were always questioning their decisions. And, and so he's, he's, he's like, Moses, like, I'm done with these people. I'm sick of them. And, uh, and we know that uh, it, it became a major, major challenge. But look at this. Look at the analogy that God uses all through Scripture on sports as we are doing March Madness. First Corinthians 9.24 says this. In a race, all the runners run. Who runs? Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking to you. Yeah. You, listen, you can't say you're... Please, please listen. We cannot say that we, are, that we are Christ followers and we're not running. We're running a race for God, guys. I'm not trying to hate on anyone here, but here's the truth. God has called us all to run a race for him. It's a lane that God has already pre-established for you. There's something wonderful and beautiful that God has designed you, that God has purposed you to do. And it doesn't all have to be ministry, okay? Not everybody's called to ministry. Maybe God has called you to government. Maybe God has called you to the entertainment industry. Maybe God has called you to medicine. But God has called every single one of us to run a race that he's designed for you. And so he says, but, but, but only one gets the prize. You know that, don't you? I love that. So run in a way that will get you the prize. Run in such a way. My question to you this day is, how are you running right now? Are you running in a way that is getting you results? Are you running in a way that is bringing you joy? Are you running in a way that's bringing you fulfillment? Or are you hardly running? Or are you always, instead of running forward, you're always running backwards. That kind of looks weird, right? And I know I see people always exercise. Like, I don't know what it does, but it <laughs> doesn't make sense to me. Keep running that way, you'll fall. You were meant to run forward, not backwards. <laughs> Amen? If you were meant to run backwards, God would have allowed your feet to <laughs> do one of those, right? Verse 25, and all who take part in the games... All who take part in the games. Ever say team church? Are you taking part in team church? It says all insane some and some who take part. No, he said everybody. You, your spouse, your children. If you're single, you. He said, all who take part in the games train hard. We work hard. We train hard. Is it easy to be a Christian? Heck no. It's so hard to be a Christian when you live in a world that is so lustful and so dark. It's so hard to be a Christian because we as Christians, we look at God's word. We look at God's plan like it's impossible. And you know what? You're right. It is impossible with you, but it's not impossible with God. It's called Team Jesus. And so when you're living your life for Christ... You can't live it unless you work hard. What does that mean? I have to work hard to read my Bible. I have to work hard to pray. Have you noticed it's so easy to stop reading your Bible? Have you noticed it's so easy to stop praying to God? Have you noticed it's so easy not to go to church? It's so much easier just to wake up and say, I'll watch live stream. It's so much easier. Why? There's no effort to that. And so God calls Christians to work hard. Stay with me. Don't, don't get lost. I have a beautiful point today. But all who take part in the games, they train hard. They do it to get the crown that will not last. So we're talking about regular sports. But we do it. Everybody say, I do it. He says, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. In other words, everything I do on this earth is preparing me for everything that I'm going to experience forever. Everything I'm training for now. When you worship, you're in training ground. Why? Because all you do in heaven is worship. If you don't like to worship and sing, guess what? You're going to hate heaven. Because that's all you, there's no sermons in heaven. There's only worship in heaven. And so um, God has called Elevate Church to train hard. God has called Elevate Church to be a team. God has called every single one of us to be team church. And our job is to win souls and to reach people and to touch the lives of people. But guess what? We're, we're not the legacy of one. We're the legacy of many. There's so many of us that God wants us to, to reach and and how many know that, get that Jesus is the head coach of our team? He's the head of every church. He's the coach. He tells us exactly what to do, when to do it, how to do it. He's the coach of this house. He's the coach of my life. He's the coach of your life. And I love this because we already saw the negative um, 
you know, decision of, of two people, Moses and Aaron. That was very negative. And, yeah, that's awesome. They started great, but there was, there was a negative moment in their life. Now, Jesus, the coach, interacts with a guy who's not even Jewish. Okay, this guy was a Gentile. And he starts looking and seeing and having this dialogue with this guy who has a game plan. And it's very interesting because you see that, that, that Jesus allows us to see this illustration of the story of this, this person he comes in contact with because he's telling us this is what's possible when you're playing team church. Look what he says in Matthew chapter 8, verse 5 through 10. This was a huge win right here. It says, now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him. So let's just stop right there. What's a centurion? A centurion was a soldier, a commander. The word centurion in the Greek means 100. That means that he was responsible for 100 soldiers. That means that this centurion soldier had authority, had power, had influence. And, he, and, and I'm sure he heard of Jesus. If not, he wouldn't be coming to Jesus asking or pleading with him for something. And so I'm sure he heard the negative side of Jesus from people saying that he was a, a, a liar, a deceiver, a false prophet, and all those things that he probably heard. But he also heard about how Jesus healed, how Jesus delivered, how Jesus set people free, how Jesus did miracles. And so now you have this Roman soldier who has authority influence and and the word centurion once again it means 100 that means he was responsible for 100 people 100 men who were there ready to go to battle and and the centurion soldier in order to identify his position as leader they would wear these 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 hats with with kind of like you just picture the usc you know the, the usc trojans they have the the whole Roman, you know, helmet with that little fluffy red thing that's on top. You know why they had the centurion soldiers wear that? Because when they would go to battle, and if you've ever been to Israel, it, there's a lot of dust, a lot of dirt. So when they would fight, the dust would just go up in the air. When the weather wouldn't cooperate, man, there would be some thick fog. And when they couldn't see because of the dust or the, the elements of the weather, like fog, as long as they saw the red little fluffy thing on top of the helmet, in the middle of chaos, they knew that all they had to do was look for that guy, look for that centurion soldier, that captain, that commander, and I follow him, I follow the leader, and we'll get out of the situation. So just so you understand who's coming to Jesus, I need to paint the picture. Because the scripture says that when he came to Jesus, he started pleading. And so when you think about pleading, here you have a man of influence, authority, who has the power to arrest Jesus, is now kneeling before Jesus, and he's having all this conversation that I'm about to read. From start to finish, he's like this. He's kneeling. He's a man in authority that knows how to be a man also under authority. Let me say that again. He's a man of authority, but he also knows how to be under authority. Too many of us only like this, but we don't like this. We don't like to take a knee. We've got to take a knee. And so what is he pleading with? What is he asking him for? Because there's so many amazing characteristics of this man's type of game he plays. He says, verse 6, saying, Lord, he's pleading with him, Lord. My servant is lying at home paralyzed and dreadfully tormented. Just think about this. I mean, if you had a servant, a housekeeper, a babysitter, a cook, a nanny, whatever you want to call it. You know what? You're busy. You got things to do. You just fire that one and go get another one. Yes or no? It's interrupting my life. I got things I got to do. But look at this guy. This guy is a man with power, but he's a man with power and a lot of love that he would even go out of his way to go look for Jesus and to ask for healing for his servant who is paralyzed. Listen, paralyzed is painful enough just to know that someone is paralyzed, that you can't move your body. But can you imagine being paralyzed? and being tormented at the same time can you imagine just the pain of that just laying there and not being able to move and then all you're doing is you are tormented in your mind in your heart maybe screaming and yelling at the same time and this soldier goes out of his way to go look for jesus and he begins to talk to him he says lord my servant is paralyzed and he's dreadfully tormented and jesus said and i love it. he says all right i'll come 
Let's go. Where do you live? I mean, I think for many of us, we would look at that and be like, whoa, wow, Jesus is going to go to my house. Right? Like he's going to go, wow, he's willing. I pray that Elevate Church, and when I say Elevate Church, I mean you, that we would be recognized for reputation. That when someone outside of this church is going through something, when you know that someone comes to you and says, hey, you know what, so-and-so is sick, that you wouldn't have the type of attitude of saying, let me call the church and have them send someone to pray, but that you would have the attitude of Jesus and say, you know what, let's go. I'll come with you. I'll come pray. That's the attitude Jesus had. I mean, if Jesus has time to go visit someone, shouldn't we make some time? And so... And so, of course, we go to the story, and, and you would think that this, this soldier would be like, dang, this is awesome. I'm going to benefit from this now. I got Team Jesus coming to my house. Dang, can you imagine what that's going to look like on Instagram when everybody sees that we were right there taking the selfie, healing my, I mean, that would be pretty amazing. You know, that's awesome. But look what he says. I just, I'm teaching on this because I want you to see how someone else plays in the kingdom. And the centurion soldier looks, says this. He answered and said, Lord. I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. What does that mean? Was he just not good enough? Was his house dirty? You know, was it messy? You know, did he need to run ahead of Jesus and throw his, you know, socks and everything under the couch? What was it that he would not allow Jesus to come to his house? Uh, as you study the, the, the depths of the, the, the Greek and Hebrew, especially Hebrew uh, law, any Gentile that would have a Jewish person, a Jewish, uh, especially Jesus being called a rabbi, a teacher, and recognized by the synagogue. And for anyone with that kind of authority to walk in the house of a Gentile was a big no-no. So think about it. Jesus was willing to cross every barrier just to go after this one man and help this man who's paralyzed and tormented. And to do it for someone who has, who not only has authority, but sees a man who knows how to submit to authority as well. And he says, I'll go with you. But the problem is this, is that in those times, if a Jewish leader were to walk into the house of a Gentile, that would not only be unpure, but they would have to do some type of ceremony, like some type of ceremonial thing to undo all the, the evil of the Gentile, the wickedness of the Gentile. And it would have to be like a whole long process. So this guy... This centurion soldier understands authority and also respected the authority of the rabbis of the Jewish tradition and said, hey, Jesus, you know what? No, I don't want you. Because why? Because this centurion soldier thought if I allow him to come in my house, man, they're going to excommunicate him from the synagogue and he won't be able to continue to preach the gospel that he's bringing to us. So just think about how much this soldier, this, this soldier had not only uh, 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 you know, a care for his servant, but he also cared about the fact that Jesus can also be excommunicated out of the synagogue. That's just, that says a lot about a person. It wasn't just about his own interest. He was also about the interest of Jesus. And that's what God wants from us. We should have this spirit where we're willing to, to, to do whatever it takes so that others can be blessed. It's not about what do you got for me? What are you going to do for me? Well, what about, and it's just I, 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 me, me, me. Look what he says. So he says, I'm not worthy based on those reasons, right? But here's what he says. He says, but only speak a word. I wonder where he got that one from. Well, think about Moses and God. God said, hey, just, just speak the word to the rock. Just tell the rock what I told you to tell it, and it's going to obey you, submit to you. It's going to yield to you. It's going to listen to you. So this guy he, he tells Jesus, just say the word, just open, just say it, just, come on, Jesus, just say it. Say the word, speak the word, and my servant will be what? Healed. For I also, look at this, for I also am a man of what? Authority. In other words, he understood. He's like, you know what? I know, Jesus, I know your authority, and I know your authority because I also got authority. In other words, he says, listen, Jesus, I know how you play your game. And, and he says, so I'm a man 
under authority, having soldiers under me. So he's giving them the whole stack, right? The whole like, okay, there's this executive, and then there's president executive. And she's like, I understand the process. But he starts telling Jesus, but check this out. Because we have this whole issue of this whole undoing of the ceremonial thing, because you were to walk into my house, let's, let's forbid that. So here's the game plan. And he starts telling Jesus, okay, so here's the game. Uh, we're going to do this. Um, so I'm a man under authority, and so I totally get it. So I got guys. I got a guy here. I got a point guard here. I got this guy, and he's like, and this guy will go here, and then this guy could come across here, and then, you know, this guy over here will run this way, and then, boom, we'll do this. So he just says, just speak the word because I'm also a man under authority. Look, he says, and if I say to this one, go, and he goes, and if I say to another, come, he comes. Do you, do you guys get this? And he says, and to my servant, do this. And he does it. And when Jesus heard it, man, he's like shocked. Jesus is like, whoa. You know why? Because it is so rare to find Christians today, especially in this culture, that understand authority. That understand not only to have authority, but also learn how to submit to authority. Listen, please. He says, when I tell a guy to do something, he does it. When I say, go this way, you go that way. When I say, do this, you do that. When I say, and so he's giving them the why of everything. And Jesus is sitting there listening to this guy. And he says this. He says, and when Jesus heard it, he what? He what? Stay with me. He what? Who was he walking with? Who do you think he was walking? Who was behind Jesus? His team. His team was his disciples. Okay, so just, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Come with me quickly. Fast, fast, fast. Follow me. Six, seven, eight. Follow me. Quick, quick. Quick, quick, quick. Come on, guys. So Jesus, like, he's walking. And now he's got this connection with this. Stand up. You're, you're, you're the guy right here. You're the centurion soldier. Come on up. And so right there, he's right there. He's, he's talking to me. And, and look, and when Jesus heard it, so you're doing all that talking we just read. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled. He's like, what in the world? I mean, it's, I, think, I think it's hard to, to impress God, don't you think? Think about it. He's the creator of all things. And all of a sudden, it's almost like he heard something he'd never heard before. Watch. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed him. He's looking at all you guys. Hey, y'all, did you all hear that? <laughs> did you just hear what he said? Hey, can you repeat that? Hey, because these guys need to hear it. So, I mean, literally, so there's obviously, there's, a, there's something that happened that now Jesus is using this guy's authority plan. And he's looking at the disciples. Y'all need to hear this guy again. And maybe y'all didn't hear this carefully. Okay, so he said that I tell this guy to do this. I tell that guy. And they do it. And it just happens. And so you just speak a word. And I know that my servant will be healed. Just say it. Just sneeze it if you want. But I know when you say it, something's going to happen. And he says, As surely I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Be seated, guys. Thank you. So he's, he's marveled. Let me give you the definition of marvel. Look at the definition of marvel. Marvel means, come on, guys, help me out. Marvel. <laughs> stupefied. It's not that kind of stupefied. <laughs> stupefied, like, what the, what in the world? Like, being utterly astonished to admire so think about this. When you know how to live under authority and when you know how to walk out authority, that attracts the marvel of God. But was it just the fact that he was a man with authority? No. You know what the fact was? He said, I, go back to that last verse, please. He said, it was his faith. I have not seen such great faith. He says right here, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. In other words, like, man, I've never heard anything like this. Think about it. Why would he say that? Here's why. Because any time that Jesus did a miracle, he was always present. When he turned water into wine, he was there. When Lazarus was in the tomb, he was there. He said, Lazarus, come forth. 
Remember when the guy was blind and, and Jesus grabbed some mud off the floor or some dirt and he spit on it <laughs> and then put it on the, on the eyes and the eyes were, he was there. Jesus was present for every miracle, every sign, and every wonder. And now he's marveling because he sees the game plan of a leader, a person who says, I respect authority, I understand authority, and I know that if you just say it, if he was living in these times as a centurion soldier, you know what he probably would have told Jesus right now? In this hour, in this culture, he would probably would have been like, hey, can you text my, my, my servant and just tell him you are healed? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes or no? Let's keep it real. Or, or can we just take a selfie and, and you just stretch your hand out like that. And, and when, I, when he gets it, he, he's, so, so he's saying, just speak it. Just, just say it. And so Jesus is marveling because he looks at his disciples and says, Peter, you need to write this one down, bro. This is amazing. This is good. You know why? Because, man, did you hear what he said? He said, if they just, if, he, if, we, if I just say it, if I just speak it, he knows already that my servant, his servant will be healed. Wow, what an amazing marvel. Here, here's why I say this. There, there's, there's only two places in the Bible where God marvels, where Jesus marvels. Number one, at the abundance of faith, which was this guy, abundance of faith. He said, I have not seen such great faith so he's like wow what if elevate church was admired by heaven because of your faith do you think do you think anything would be impossible for us as a team no honestly do you think there'd be less sickness less less you know issues and problems with our kids less drama in the church maybe <laughs> you think there'd be more miracles in this house you think we'd see great financial breakthroughs? Yeah, God wants us to marvel. The second place where Jesus marveled was this one, the absence of faith. Oh, well, let me read it to you because this is where that one came from. That's why he looked at his disciples and he turned around and he had a little conversation with them because there was a little issue here. Look at this. Um, uh, look at, at uh, Luke 8, verse 25. It says, this is when the disciples were in the storm. Do you guys remember the story? And it says, but... Because the disciples, they woke him up. They were freaked out. And they basically told Jesus, don't you give a rip about us? Don't you care about us? We're dying, aren't you? Why are you sleeping? Why are you resting? And they're going off on Jesus. And Jesus, of course, we know he stands up and he comes a storm. And Jesus comes back to them and he says, where is your what? Where's, what's wrong? Are you all crazy? I'm walking with you. I'm, I'm in the boat. I'm with you. I never leave you nor forsake you. Where is your faith? And they were afraid. And they what? Oh, yeah. They thought they marveled. No, Jesus was marveled at the absence of their faith. And they marveled, saying to one another, who can this be? For even he commands even the winds and the water. And they what? And they obey him. They what? Obey him. They what? obey him even the winds and the waves know how to yield to the voice of God that's why the centurion soldier said you just speak it and I believe that my servant will be healed that's where we need to come to guys we need to have we need to change our game we need to change our attitude and we need to start having that idea that you know what I'm going to take God at his word and I'm going to stop questioning what God said and what God is doing in my life. And I'm going to start accepting what he wants to give me and how he wants to heal me and how he wants to anoint me. I'm going to stop fighting God and I'm going to start submitting to God. I'm going to start yielding to the presence of God. I'm going to start yielding to his word because his word wants to set me free. His word wants to liberate me. But God needs a person that's ready to take a knee. Amen. I bet the disciples were probably ticked off at that guy like, man, you jerk. Yeah, you had to sh you had to shoot, you had to just you had to go there, didn't you? And Jesus is like, "Come on, guys, where you at?" He's like, "I haven't seen this," and so they're surprised. It was like the boom, you know. He was floored, like just thinking, "Wow, look at your neighbor and say, how big is your submission?" Yeah, seriously, how big is your submission? 
How big is your submission? There's a famous man who was the president of the Baptist church, and he made a very powerful statement. And, and I, I love when I, when I see men who have actually lived out something and not just say something just to sound good, but they lived it out. And here's what he said. Adrian Rogers said this. He said, we will never be over those things God has set under us until we learn to be under those things that God has placed over us. There is strength through surrender. That is so true. There's so much truth to living a life that knows how to be submitted to any authority that God places over us. Any. I'm going to say that again. Any. I'm not here to be political with you because I'm not into politics. I'm here to bring you the truth and God's word. And so here you have this centurion soldier who has 100 men under him, and yet he knows how to yield and surrender his challenge his fears to Jesus write these few things quickly God is the author of authority ever say God is the author of authority okay think about it you can't even spell authority without author what do I mean by that God is the author and the finisher of your faith God is the author of the story of your life so why would you why would you reject the story that God wants to give you why would you push back the story that God wants to accomplish in you so God is the author of all authority but you can't have an authority until you know who your author is God is the author of all things amen he is the end from the beginning he is the author and the finisher he is the king of kings the lord of lords he is the alpha and he's the omega there is God, is, God, is, God does not lack anything. God has everything you and I need. He's the author. And I say this because so many times, if you don't learn how to, how to respect authority, you'll be that Christian that starts using Scripture for your benefit. You'll use it for you just so that you can, you can super exceed the authority that God has placed over you. And, and if you're not careful, you hear things, and I hear this a lot in the Christian community. I hate my boss. Or I don't like my leader. I, I hate my leader. Uh, this is a famous one in America. I hate my president. It's big. And I get it. Does he say some stupid stuff? Yes. But do you say some stupid stuff? Yes. We all say some stupid. All of us. You can cry, listen, you can cry all you want. He, he, he ain't moving nowhere. The only person that's getting a... You know, uh, no sleep at night is you. That dude's sleeping very nicely. He's fine. You can be bitter, angry, resentful, or you can just accept the fact that God is the author of all authority, period. Look in the Bible. There was a king named Nebuchadnezzar. The dude was wicked, dark, ugly, and horrible, and yet God had, a, uh, had a, a man of God serving him named Daniel. So instead of complaining, how about say, God, use me. Use me to be a voice in those broken, hurting people. Use me to touch and make a difference in those people instead of being the one that's always complaining about leadership. Don't be the person that says, you know what? Well, let's say you had someone that you work with. They got promoted. You didn't. And you say things like this. Why didn't I get promoted? You know, I'm sure I can do a better job than they can. I'm smarter than them. Be careful. Don't say things like that. I know more. That's a big one. You, listen, you can have all kinds of knowledge, but if you don't have love, man, you're just noise. You're noise. It's not about how much you know. It's about how hard you love. That's what it's about. I can care less of how much knowledge I have or anyone I know has. What I want to know is, but do you love me? Amen? That's what God wants. And so we can be the worst when it comes to attacking people with scripture. Let's look at quickly. We're done. We're done. Romans 13. And then I'm going to tell you a quick story. Can I tell you a quick story? We're almost done. Romans 13 verse 1 through 5 says this. He says, all of you. Everybody say todos. Todos must obey. Those who rule over you. You must obey those who what? Rule over you. 
whether you like it or not, you must obey those who rule over you. And he says, there are no authorities except the ones that God has chosen. Those who now rule have been chosen by who? You mean my goofy boss right now has been chosen by God? Yes. How does that make sense? Does God ever make sense about everything? God had, listen, it's not, it's not about why did he choose her or why did he choose him. It's about, but what's your spirit? What's your attitude in the people you serve under? Are you listening? What's your attitude? We always hear it. Attitude is altitude until you got to get your attitude adjusted. Those who now rule have been chosen by God. So whoever opposes the authorities, opposes leaders whom God has appointed. Don't be a hater. Those who do that will be judged. If you do what is right, you won't need to be afraid of your rulers. But watch out. If you do what is wrong, you don't want to be afraid of those in authority, do you? Then do what is right and you will be praised. And the one in authority serves God for your good. But if you do wrong, watch out. Rulers don't carry a sword for no reason at all. Isn't that true sometimes? People can be cray-cray. He says they serve God. And we already established, listen, it's not your job to judge whether they're right leaders or wrong leaders. That's not your job. God, God didn't get off the throne and put you up there to start judging people. When you start judging people, you dethrone God and you put you on the seat. You better watch it. Because what a man sows is what he'll reap. Watch what you judge because you'll be judged back. And the return is stronger than the first one that you dealt with. And they serve God says, and, 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 uh, and the ruler punishes anyone who does wrong, and you must obey authorities, then you will be punished. You must also obey them because you know it's the right thing to do. How many believe it's the right thing to do to respect authority? Honestly, after hearing today, you have to respect authority. But uh, you don't know my boss. You don't know how mean they are. You, it doesn't matter. Are you, are you there to obey you and do your plan, or are you there to obey God? Whose plan do you want? Because when you're under God's plan, you're under God's blessing. When you rebel against God, now you've not only, not, not only have you rebelled against the authority God has placed over you, but you didn't rebel against man, you rebelled against God. And I get it, we've all been hurt. Look, your attitude towards human authority that you can see reveals your attitude about your Heavenly Father that you can see. In other words, how you respect authority right now of the people that you do life with at work, at home, at church, reveals the attitude of your heart with your heavenly father it says a lot about you respect it honor it number two rebellion leads to opposite of freedom rebellion leads to the opposite of freedom and what do i mean by that i've already said it when you resist authority we're trying to get free from some people or some things right you're, you're trying to but how many know that that if you want god's blessing your character must be tested. And when your character is tested and you pass the test, now God can trust you with authority. But if you keep failing the test of authority and character, God can't trust you with more. God says, he who's faithful with little will be ruler over much. You want, you want to see God's blessing over your life? You have to learn how to respect. You got to stop letting the flesh get the, the best of you. Let me give you point number three. In God's economy, you can't lead if you can't be led. I'm going to say it again. In God's economy, you can't lead if you can't be led. If you cannot be led, you cannot lead. The greatest leaders are the greatest followers. We know that. Jesus always gave his disciples an open door to speak freely. Right. He modeled it. He showed them. Are you here today? Let me, let me tell you, I've had two seasons in my life where I had haters. One in the business world when I, when I worked in, 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 in a company and one in the church. And they, listen, they live in both. The church people are the hardest. You know, like I expect it from the world, but dang, I don't expect it from some leaders. You know what I'm saying? And when I was in the world, I remember this this boss 
I had in. And so he was like the general, and then I was the, like the assistant. So basically, I can override anything that was probably not uh, legal or if it was something that would um, compromise the, the integrity of the billions of dollars that we were responsible for. But this one boss... Um, he couldn't stand me, man. He hated me with a passion. And I never did nothing to this guy. I was always a hard worker. And, and obviously, I moved up in the company ranks because I worked hard. I, I was a great leader. I had staff people under. I mean, I worked, I worked. I did what I had to do. But this guy was a flaring homosexual. Like, I'm talking about gay on steroids. No, it was like, it was like, I mean, it was like, like diva, like just everything. And, and we'd be in our, in our staff meetings with all of the, the, we're talking all the executives, all of us. And this dude would talk about what he did with another guy the night before and be perverted and disgusting. And everybody's like, ha, 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 ha. And everyone's laughing and all. So be careful because people are watching you. Watch what you laugh about. Guard it. <laughs> Guard it. Be careful. And so he would look at me all angry, like, like just waiting for me to at least throw a smile at him, like, oh, hey, that's cute. And I would just sit there. Now, I wasn't hating either. I wasn't like, you jerk, you know. I expect the world to do what it does. It sins. And so I sat there, and I'm just like, man, this sucks. It's hard. It's difficult because I felt like, like I'm opposing their rhythm, their movement. But I'm there to work, right? And so he hates on me, and he would make my life miserable. And there would be reports that he would have me do because he was still the boss. And, uh, and though I had authority to override certain things for him, but when he asked for something, I had to do it. And I already knew that, that we didn't have to do those, those, those system checks that he wanted. He just did that to be this thorn in my side and just kept just daggering and daggering and daggering. And guess what? I, I knew the owners personally. You know, we weren't friends or anything, but I knew them personally. They knew my character. Obviously, they, they, they promoted me into management position in their company. And it's a big company. And here's the thing. I could have called and I could have made a complaint about him. But my, my intention was to win this guy to Jesus. Like that was my goal. Like, okay, God, I hate this guy. I can't stand, but I have to deal with my heart. Like God created me a clean heart. You said to pray for your enemies. So I had to, you know, pray for this guy. And so I could have called corporate. I could have made a complaint. I, I could have, I could have, you know, called the office and said, man, this guy's a jerk. He makes me do stuff that I shouldn't be doing. But you know what? I just kept my mouth shut. You know why? Because God says, I will exalt the humble, but I'll resist the proud. So watch your mouth. And so I just submitted and just quiet, like, okay, I got to do it. And I'll never forget, that brother got in trouble. He did something in the company that was off. And, of course, your natural instinct is you want to laugh at that one, huh? Like, now you want to, like, yeah, thanks, God, for whacking him, you know? Like, that'll teach you one. But I didn't. I remember, I still, to this day, as I'm telling you, I can remember clearly when I walked by his office and I saw him with his head down. And I knew because being that I was the, uh, the loss prevention director of the company, I knew that this dude was in some serious, serious trouble. He was in trouble. And I walked in his office and I said, hey, Randy. And he said, what do you want? And I said, listen, I, I, I know that this is not looking good. But I want to tell you that, that, you know, you're a great, and I just started encouraging him. You know, I don't know what the heck I said, but I know this. I did say this to him. I said, can I pray for you? And he was just like shocked, like, because he knows he's been a jerk. And I said, can I pray for you? And he literally just looked up and he said, yeah, yeah. And I did. I prayed for him and God touched his life. And when I was done with that prayer, I said, Randy, I may not see you in this company anymore. <laughs> That's the truth. May not see you here anymore because you may get fired. But I want to see you in heaven. And I said, Would you receive Christ today? And I explained, you know, the salvation and the whole thing. And he said to me, You know, Mar Marisa, you know I can't because he's gay. And of course, the Christian religious people would immediately say, You know, you're right, you're going to hell. Yes or no? But listen, who you're not judge. You let you let God judge that sin. Your job is to love, and love will cover the multitude of sins, amen? And love will compel him to hopefully. And so I said, would you? And I said, listen, I'm not here to judge your lifestyle. I'm here to talk to you about your eternity. And I led him to Jesus right there on the spot, and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. 
It was awesome. It was beautiful. God, God will, he, listen, God will exalt the humble, but he'll resist the proud people. Final story. Stand your feet. Let's go. Church. <laughs> oh, church. Church is full of a lot of characters. Praise Jesus. And we've all been them. I've been a character in church. So have you. We've all been goofy at some, at some point. All of us have. But I remember this leader. This leader was just a hater. Didn't like me for some reason. I know what it was. I was young. I was 21 years old. I came to Christ. God accelerated my, 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 my spiritual growth. And it wasn't because I was God's favorite, you know, even though sometimes I feel like I'm his favorite, but I'm not. It's kind of like my mom. I was the, I was the favorite of my mom. My, my sisters hate it. You know, it's like, oh, mijo, come here. You know, it's just, especially if you're the middle child, you're just like always the favorite. Um, but anyways, uh, I, I remember that God was accelerating my spiritual growth. And, and by the age of 22, I was leading men at, who were 40, 50 years old in the faith. And, and they didn't like it. I was hated by so many older people because I was just this kid. They saw me as this kid that didn't know it, anything. And, and so the staff guy would get bothered because I just kept, climbing the ladder not because I was looking for position or jockeying for position I just did whatever I was asked to do and I just submitted and I yielded and I went for it and then God has blessed the rest amen and so this person man would just like ah you know uh, if there was crap on the floor hey go clean that up you know if someone had to go do errands and someone would say hey I'll go pick up the stuff no 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 Marisha will go pick that up uh, if, if we'd be in a conference room and there was all the pastors and I'd walk inside there and, and they're like, okay, we need more drinks. Oh, yeah, Mauricio, go to the store, get some. Like, I was like, mm, you don't want to suck this dude up. You know what I'm saying? Like, Lord, uh, you ever felt that way? Like, you just want to smack someone, right? Even in church? You ever want to smack someone in church? And, and I just, I'm like, you know what? But I, every time I just like, yes. And, and listen, and, and this same person, like, hated me so much that they, they created a lie about me. And they try to take me out in ministry. And, and this person just like sowed a seed of lies. And, and, and it, it got so ugly that, that um, my pastors and even an outside influence had to come in. And we all had to sit down and have a conversation. But let me tell you, one thing I have learned is that I don't have to fight my battles. God fights them for me. And I had a choice to defend myself. And to tell them everything this jerk did to me while I was there working and say, you know what? No, let me tell you, he's had it out for me since the beginning, but I didn't. I shut my mouth and I just said, I answered all my questions. Nope, I didn't do that. Nope, that wasn't me. I didn't. And of course, I defended myself in the answer of the questions that were being asked. Let me tell you something. Within weeks, if not a month, this person was exposed and found out. And they were let go. I'm telling you this because regardless of how horrendous of a boss you may have, a leader, it's not about them. It's about your attitude. It's about your, rea your reaction or your response. It's about your heart. God said, guard your heart with all diligence because out of that heart's going to flow out your issues of life. So it's not about their issues. It's about your issues. It's not about their attitude. It's about your attitude. It's not about their ways. It's about your way. It's not about, you know, their sin. It's about your sin. It's not about their wrong. It's about your wrong. And so you have to decide and say, this is the kind of team Jesus, I'm going to be like this centurion soldier that knows how to take a knee even when he doesn't want to. Amen. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.